chat. There you go. All right. Well, yes, as uh, Kevin has said, we are Michael and Michelle Bowen, and uh, we are with Multiply Ministries. I, I am the Director of Theology and Missions, and Michelle is the Director of Training. So if she does a little bit more in the training here tonight, you'll understand why. But um, as Kevin said, that she and I do have some experience working together, and both of us just have a heart's desire for um, reaching the lost as well as uh, equipping and training those who are also interested in doing the same. Uh, uh, Pastor Kevin, thank you so much for inviting us to join you tonight and to share a little bit about cross-cultural ministry. No, uh, if you can maybe scooch in closer to your hubby and talk into his computer. <laughs> that was a little bit better, but not by much. Try it again. Yeah, Michelle, if you're talking, I'm not getting there anything. We go. There we I go. Heard, I realized I, I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> okay, here we go. So um, as we begin, let's get to know each other a little bit. Generally speaking, our workshops are highly interactive and um, we don't want that to be an exception with the Zoom. So what I'd like for you to do is to use your chat feature. If you look at the bottom of your screen, it'll be a little white box and it will say chat and then you can type in there to respond. Um, so what I'd like you to do is to kind of share with me a little bit about your experiences and to um, give you some practice in using this chat feature. Um, tell me, have you lived, yes or no, have you lived in New Jersey your whole life? So then, oh, there we go, good. Um, and if no, where did you live before? So Michigan. Massachusetts, Ooh, Thailand, Philippines. Okay, awesome. And before COVID, did you like to travel? St. Louis. Woohoo! And we didn't introduce where we live, but we are sitting here in St. Louis. So I saw um, someone there said they had been there in St. Louis for four years. So a little bit of a connection there. Where do you live at? Uh, Joel. Joel. So Joel, what part of St. Louis? I was at oh, Wash U. Very nice. Um, so let me ask this also. Um, Six months from Bruce. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Who? Tell me um, a little bit about your testimony. Everyone um, put into the chat feature how old you were when you first trusted Christ as your Savior. Watch that for me, okay. And then um, who first shared the gospel with you? Like, was it your mother? Was it your father? Was it someone from, um, uh, from your church? Maybe it was a friend, a coworker. And how confident are you in sharing the gospel with others? Are you very confident? Are you... <laughs> um, are you, um, are you kind of new to sharing the gospel? Are you comfortable with the gospel, but haven't really done it very often? Well, as you consider those questions, also consider this question. I love, um, I think, Kevin, you asked that question as we began, why are we here, right? Um, and that, that is a very integral question to our Christian walk, really. What is the dominant driver in why we do what we do? Are we seeking to serving, uh, serve the Lord to glorify his name? Um, but we also have to consider, is there some way, are we working to elevate ourselves through being a good Samaritan? Or maybe even uh, virtue signaling, that's a popular phrase these days, right? That we're reaching out to others, that we're being a good Christian and doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, right? 
part of my personal testimony is that at a training for a well-known Christian ministry, I was challenged by, the, by that very question. Why are you doing what you are doing? And my honest reply, I remember sitting there thinking, well, someone asked me to do it. And I said, yes, there was a need. Someone asked me to fill it. And I was, I was able to fill it up. While simple obedience and being willing to serve our great responses, we need to move beyond that first step. We need to go deeper into the reasoning behind what we do. So that question prompted me to see that not only was I fulfilling this need in this ministry, but I was also involved in a gospel ministry with the opportunity to teach children about the good news of Jesus Christ. In cross-cultural ministry, we also have the opportunity to not only help individuals outside the church, but to share with them the life-changing message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So before we really get into our introductory lesson today, and trust me, this is very introductory, um, but we really want to get you started on, on a clear foundation. Let's take some time to pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for loving us enough to pursue you, even when we rejected you. We praise you for the diversity that you've ordained among the people in your world. Lord, we just thank you for sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, to convict us of our responsibility to be your ambassadors and to equip us with your spiritual gifts in building your church. God, we just ask that you would awaken in our hearts that to the nations that we would earnestly desire to be your servants and to be the servants to the people whom you have created, that we would humble ourselves as Jesus humbled himself in order to seek the lost with the gospel. Please prepare our hearts and minds um, and the hearts and minds of those who are soon gonna encounter the gospel, your holy word, your, your good news of truth. And um, may they be sensitive to the good news of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. It's in the name of Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit that we do pray. Amen. Okay, so in Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 9, John shares that in his vision from Jesus, he looked and saw before him a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Missions in the 18 and 1900s look like churches sending people overseas to reach those who have not heard the name of Jesus. In today's century, there are still places of, of vast lostness in the world where no one has heard the name of Jesus, where no one has heard the gospel, and this is still a relevant means of missions. However, today is also a day where people travel more easily around the globe. And just last night, I had a video call with um, a lady in Romblom in the Philippines. And this morning, I had a conversation with a ministry partner in India and another with a ministry partner in Uganda. And then this afternoon, we had another um, video conversation with someone else from India. And here we are having a conversation from Missouri to New Jersey. Uh, before we moved, um, the street that we lived on was very global. The school district was comprised of 85% of students whose parents were born in a different nation. In the city of St. Louis, over 21,000 of the official <laughs> residents were born in a different nation. And those numbers don't include those who are not officially counted. And it doesn't include children also. We are a global society and the nations have come to us. Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, 19, we, we read that great commission. And he promised to send us the Holy Spirit to empower us to do this work, to, to be like, to, to share our testimonies, to testify in Jesus' behalf. In Acts 1, 8, um, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, guess what? The ends of the earth are in Jerusalem for, for us right now. So we are going to take a significant moment to clarify the gospel. Regardless if you are sharing the gospel with someone you know well or someone whose background is dynamically different, we must be able to communicate the gospel effectively. 
So on your notes, if you have those, uh, you will see a cross. If you don't have the, a copy of the notes, you'll see that as we go through the gospel basics, we will be drawing a cross um, as we go through it. So this is a mnemonic, I can never say that word. Mnemonic. <laughs> yeah, it's a reminder, visual reminder, uh, that when you think of the gospel, you think of the cross. Let's compare the character of God and the character of people. So God, he's holy. Revelation 4.8 tells us that God is holy, that he is eternal. He is all powerful. By contrast, people are sinful. We know a verse for that, don't we? Romans 3.23 tells us that all people in all times, in all places, sin. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that brings dishonor to God. It is our rejection and disobedience to him. Our character is what divides us from God. Through our sin, we have earned death. It separates us from God. Oh, yep. See, when I can't see a scribbling <laughs> fast and the smoke rising from the pencils, I uh, forget that you need to write things down. And uh, in the chat box um, is a link to the notes there. Uh, Kevin, I see you put that there. Thank you. All right, so here we're going to consider the actions of God versus the actions of people. So God responded to our need for restoration. God demonstrated his own love for us by sending Jesus to die in our place. If our sin earns death, God's holiness gives life. Because Jesus is God, he is holy. Because he is holy, God's justice can be met. Only Jesus could take our punishment and shame because only Jesus is righteous and without sin. So here we draw a line from God to people because that is who Jesus is. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So the line of character, that, that line, the dotted white line that you see, that's representing the sin that separates us from God. And the line from God is holy to people are sinful. God sending Jesus, demonstrating his own love for us, you know, Romans 5, 8, and sending Jesus, that is drawing the cross. And that is kind of your mnemonic tool to rem remember these verses. So remember how we said God is eternal, the same yesterday, today, and forever? Remember how we said he is all powerful? God knew before he created us that we would reject him. Before the beginning of time, it was his plan to redeem us through Jesus. He revealed his plan to us through his holy word, the Bible, the scriptures. So what is the gospel? My favorite verse or verses for declaring what the gospel is, is found there in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. It was God's plan all along. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to us for restoration to him. So before we go on and kind of review, can you tell me in the chat box, um, are the, these verses, verses that you have memorized? Are, are you good at memorizing? Is that something that you personally do? Or are you familiar with them? We've heard them, yes. Um, but is it something that we've stored in our hearts? Oh. Okay, good. Um, I, I'm gonna share this a little bit. So, you know, um, yeah, stay there for just a second. Um, okay, very good. When, when we're trying to recall scripture, because scripture aligns itself together so beautifully, you know, because God ordained that, um, sometimes they can overlap and get kind of twisted in your head. And so I work with children often. And so we will memorize verses to song. So Michael's mom actually taught me this years and years ago. 
okay, Year, years <laughs> and years ago, um, for the First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, um, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So, don't um, don't shy away from using songs or mnemonics or things to help you to memorize. Uh, we actually have a whole workshop on how to memorize scripture even as adults called Peeling Stick. Um, but take some time to memorize these verses if you haven't memorized them already. Because when you get into a conversation, if they're so well known that they just rattle off your tongue, it'll be much easier to converse. All right, so as we continue in the slides, if God's response to us was to send Jesus, what action is required on our part? Are, are, are we all saved then? Is everybody saved? Well, um, Scripture tells us clearly that no, that's not the case. We must choose God. He wants an authentic relationship from him. It is available freely to all, but we must choose to believe it. John 3 tells us that we are born condemned. We reject God's word and tell him we want to find our own way. We must choose to confess Jesus as our Lord, to believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, these aren't magic words, but they are words that express our heartfelt trust in the one who has the power to save us. You see that one? There's, you got Romans 10, 9 up there? Yes. I was down the bottom left corner. Okay. I got people over <laughs> portions of my screen, so it's hard to see um, where it is. But yeah, that's Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, all right. So we're going to take a minute to review. I know we aren't in person. Normally when we do an in-person training, this is when we break into those small groups and have everybody um, uh, talk a little bit together. But um, but we need to uh, to speak it out. I saw a couple in the, a couple of people who had their spouse or someone else with them. So go ahead and you can share with them. But um, as we go through the slides again, um, speak with. We're just going to say it. We're yeah, going right. to go through the slide and. We're going to start with a blank slide. You have notes, so you, you can go from that. But we're going to say the words out loud because it will help us to practice. And it feels weird even if you're in a room all by yourself. But the whole goal is to use this in speaking to somebody else to share the gospel. So let's get the awkwardness out of the room. Yeah. And, and secretly, that's a teaching technique that helps you remember because you're not just hearing or you're not just reading, but you're also saying so. It's uh, using different modalities, if you're familiar with those phrases, okay? All right, so first, we compare the character of God and the character of people. So let's say it together. God is holy. holy. Revelation 4, 8. People are sinful. Romans 3, 23. Our sin burns death and separates us from God. But God's gift brings life and reunites us through Jesus. Romans 6, 6 23. Christ, Christ died, died for, for our sins, according, sins according, according to the scriptures, scriptures and, and that, that he was buried on the third day, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Now, if you say the references, you remember later where it's found, right? And I will tell you that many people that I've shared the gospel with trusted in Christ and told me that the reason why they believed is because it wasn't my words. It was God's words. And the fact that I was able to tell them exactly what God's word said, they were able to verify it and affirm it. Um, There's a lady that I was sharing the gospel with during COVID and so she's in her car and I'm standing outside the car and she's looking it up on her phone, Googling the verses and the fact that I was able to say, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. She was like, that's right. She said, that's right. Jesus is my Lord because she trusted. Yeah, that was a neat day because we were trying to find out how we could minister to the community uh, it, it, even through the COVID uh, restrictions that we were facing. 
And so we shared the gospel through the phone and Michelle didn't know she was doing that. She didn't know that she was uh, checking, check, doing a fact check on her. So. Well, not until I went down to meet her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, next up. So what action is required for people? So Romans 10, 9, if you declare with, with your, your mouth that Jesus, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised, raised him from, from the, the dead, dead, you will be saved. All right, great. So now that you can clearly articulate the gospel, let's make sure that your testimony emphasizes the gospel. Sharing your story and your experience is one of the most effective means of sharing the gospel. And when we are working with um, people who come from an Eastern culture, storytelling is really important. Oral cultures, storytelling is, is very, it's, it's like sacred. And so it's important that you can articulate your testimony. Yeah, what Michelle's referring to is we are a very literary society that we re we learn through reading, but that's not the same around the world. Uh, oral cultures learn by hearing. And, um, and, and that so, doesn't mean that they can't read. Right. And it doesn't mean that they're not highly educated and professionals. It just means that they <laughs> value storytelling. <laughs> okay, so in the chat box, again, what I want you to do is to share your testimony. And I'm only going to give you about a minute to work it out because I know that most of us can talk about Jesus and what he's done in our lives until he returns. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> okay, but for now, what I want you to do is to focus on a 30-second testimony that's gospel-centric. <laughs> And I'm going to give you kind of a minute to think about that and write that out. And then I'm going to share mine with you. And then if you need to kind of reevaluate what you want to write, you can. But let me give you a second to think it through. Okay, I'm going to give you mine as an example. Okay, but I still want to see yours. This doesn't let you off the hook. I first learned about my need for a savior when I attended vacation Bible school. Before then, I didn't even know that I was a sinner. Uh, I thought that my relationship with God was based on the good things that I did. And I was unaware of my offenses toward him. It was at Vacation Bible School that I learned that all people are sinners, Romans 3.23, and that I needed Jesus to restore my relationship with him, Romans 6.23. Only Jesus could do this because as God is perfect, Jesus is perfect, and Jesus is holy because he's God. And God loved me, and he willingly took his place for me on the cross so I could live with him forever, John 3.16. And all I had to do was to believe in him. My life has been forever changed. And I have peace during times of trouble because even if the world is crashing in around me, I know that God is with me and he truly cares. If you want to have the peace that passes understanding and you're willing to call Jesus as Lord because you believe in your heart that he died in your place and that he rose again to give you new life, you will be saved too. Romans 10, 9. Is this something that you want to believe? Okay, so take a minute. So I know that you all have trusted Christ as Savior. And if you haven't, now listen, um, Michael and I have been to many, many trainings and workshops and churches in which someone has said, you know what? I've known all of these things and I've known them for a long time, but I don't think I've ever said, wow, Jesus, you're the boss of my life. Yeah, this, I, I need to surrender to you. And if you haven't done that, this is the perfect time to do it. And there's no embarrassment about it because I can promise you that everybody would rejoice. So go ahead and just make a statement or two. Say, I trusted Christ when... My mother talked to me when I went to vacation Bible school and a coworker said, and this is what I was told and this is what I believed. Because we're doing this on a phone and not a computer, yeah. it's not as easy to access that chat and type in things. Okay, I, I'm totally confused as to how it's going through. So. 
Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. So. Yeah. So when I saw it lived out, the stories became real. And I knew that God's way is the best way to live. Our life is a testimony. That's so important. I think so. So Michael is going to talk to us a little bit about what a worldview is. Turning it into text. It could be for now. We just realized that uh, our computers weren't plugged in and that'd be a bad thing to, <laughs> <laughs> to lose power in the middle of this. All right. So yeah, uh, before we jump into the worldview, I just wanted to um, to reiterate uh, one of the importance, one of the important things about sharing our testimony is uh, having your own personal experiences in there intermingled with scriptures, because it, as Michelle mentioned earlier, it's not just our words, but it is what um, what God has done for you and, and and what he's done in his word for all of us. Uh, secondly, preparing yourself is essential to have it ready to go so that when someone asks, you're prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. If you make yourself available, God is going to put people in your life. Um, I've had the opportunity to lead people to the Lord at the deli counter at the grocery store. And at that time, you know, I have five kids and they're in and out of the cart and I really just want to get in and out of the store. And someone leaned over to me and said, you know, um, I don't understand why I'm going to cry, but I'm crying here over cheese because it reminds me of my mother and she passed away. And so I was able to encourage this person and to pray for this person. And this person just asked me, what is this about you? I feel like God put you here for me. Like you're just bringing me peace. And I was able to share the gospel with them. I've shared the gospel with people at the park and at Walmart and in frustrating points of my life with tow truck drivers and so forth. So if you make yourself available, God will put people in your life in unexpected places. So as Michael said, it's so important that you can tell your story. If, um, if you are not seeing the, the chat box, uh, Pastor Kevin shared a tool to help awesome. work out the testimony in there. So <clears throat> just for those who may not, um, may not know, I know things sometimes change when the screen share happens, but if you move your mouse up to the top and hover over the word more, the word chat will show up. And if you click on that, then you can chat if you if you don't know how to get it open. That's that's how you do it. Okay. So I hope that's helpful for and we're not forgetting anyone for that reason. So all right. So yeah. So next up is uh, worldview. So the the testimony or the the gospel is laying our foundation for being prepared, and the worldview is preparing for understanding. Uh, so worldview. When you think about it, it's how one sees the world, how they look at the world. And I can't see everyone's faces, but usually during this time, uh, I, I look around and say, all right, I know a significant amount of us wear glasses, right? Um, <laughs> some of us may have come into glasses later in life than others. I've worn glasses since high school. My wife recently has discovered the necessity for reading using them. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it changes, but when, when I take these glasses off, I cannot see in the distance. Um, I, I, I can still see things up close, but nowadays I, uh, well, that's regardless. Anyways, <laughs> our glasses change how we see the world around us, right? And the way that we see the world is affected by our world view. So what is a biblical worldview? It's seeing the world with the understanding that God created our universe, that we rejected him, that this rejection is sin. And because of sin, our, our world is broken. It isn't that God allows bad things to happen because he doesn't know or doesn't care about us. It's because we didn't care about God. We didn't care about his authority that, that, that he has in this world that he created. God saw us in our destruction and pursued us. His loving grace 
he re in his grace, he redeemed us. So a biblical worldview is seeing the world through the lens of scripture. Okay, so we're going to talk about three different worldviews, which are the three major ways that people see the world and process life through it. This is probably the point that you're like, this is why I got on the Zoom call today. I want to know these worldviews. I want to know the scriptures um, to use when sharing the gospel with someone who sees the world differently than me. Um, a couple of notes before we begin. If you have the handout, you'll likely want to flip it over um, and write on the back if these concepts are new to you because we didn't give you a whole lot of space there. Um, secondly, um, I want to define a couple of terms for you. Um, this will really kind of help us going forward. Society. Society is a group of people. So America is a society. Um, it's a society of people who live in the United States. New Jersey is a society. It's a group of people who live in a Northeastern state called New Jersey. Your neighborhood is a society. Uh, fans of a particular sport or team are a society. Uh, they come together to watch or play baseball or hockey or golf or football. Um, so if you got New York Mets fans meeting uh, New York Yankee fans, is it going to be a good reaction? <laughs> be from the same society as baseball fans, but they're in separate sub-societies of, of different sports mm -hmm. teams. The church is a society. The church is the family of God. And so we're in the same society because we are believers, but we fellowship and worship in different local expressions of the church. And so those are two sub-societies. Within your church, you probably have youth group, you probably have children's ministry, you probably have adult Bible studies, and each of those are societies. Now, um, next, what I want to do is I want to define the word culture for you. Many people interchange the idea of customs and culture, but I want to really clarify that for you for a moment. Culture is what society values. Society is the group of people and culture is what society values. If you're a Marvel movies fan, then um, you're gonna value superheroes and special effects. If you're a fisherman, you're gonna value the outdoors and a quiet, a good rod, some tackle. Customs are the elements that we see that derive from those values, that society the culture, right? So customs are the elements that we see that derive from those values. In Asia, people will um, they'll, they'll bow to each other when, when they greet someone. And the bows might look different. So like in India and in Pakistan, you know, they're gonna bow like this. But if you're in Eastern Asia, they're gonna bow, you know, this way and at the waist. And, and bowing is a way to show honor because they greatly value honor. They have the custom of bowing to show that honor, okay? Um, in the United States, our society values time and money. And when we say arrive by nine, what we really mean is 10 minutes before nine because arriving early is a custom that demonstrates our culture. It's important to understand these things because when we present the gospel, we want to do it through scriptures that reflect the shared values of that society. Now, here's an awesome thing. God, when he put together his word over thousands of years through so many people, through different languages and people in, in different occupations and statures and so forth, he aligned everything perfectly, right? You know, God's an errant, perfectly aligned word that all of the gospel, all of scripture refers to all of these different worldviews. So you're not going to have to look for something creative. The scriptures that are there, um, many times the same passage will have all three of these worldviews presented. So if you're just a student of God's word, you're, you're going to be fine. Okay, so let's talk about guilt, innocence. So this is very often kind of a Western um, view. That's how you'll hear it. But really, I would say it's like North America in United States, Canada, and then also Australia. Because those who are really focused on the guilt innocence are focused 
on right and wrong and independence. They highly value individuality. Um, even Europe has kind of a, a community sense that, that we'll get to a little bit later. They're a little bit hodgepodge. We all are. We're going to have like probably two worldviews, one primary, one secondary. Um, but in the United States, most of us have this guilt innocence worldview. Uh, we highly value justice. If you notice, like when there's there's riots and protests, it's because people are valuing justice. Um, they see clear lines of right and wrong. Now, here's the thing. You and I might disagree upon what is right and what is wrong. We might have different opinions about what justice is, but the fact of the matter is we all value justice and we all are very concerned about truth and honesty and right and wrong. Um, judges in our, in our nation are very well respected because they have that authority over justice. Um, as parents, we raise our children to develop internal moralistic codes. Um, again, it's that whole right and wrong thing. And we require action to demonstrate belief. You know, some churches ask somebody to walk down the aisle to demonstrate their faith. Um, we focus on baptism because the baptism is what communicates publicly our, our decision to um, to connect with Jesus, you know, in, in his trust. death, burial, right, to align ourselves with, with the work that he did and we trust in him. So we might have, uh, if we're in a children's meeting, we might tell them, everybody bow your head and share the gospel and say, if you've trusted Christ as your savior, raise your hand so that way um, we can talk to you afterward. Like we, we want action. When we look at like our politicians, we look at their voting record, action is so important. So we're going to look here at some scriptures. And Mike, can you look these up for me? Um, these are scriptures that really communicate well the gospel to someone who has a worldview of guilt versus innocence. So the first one we're going to look up is Ephesians 1, verse 7. And actually, if you read the, the whole book of Ephesians, um, it's it's about unity, right? And it's about relationships, both like in the church and with your family and, and with others. So the whole book of Ephesians is great for um, seeing the gospel shared through multiple worldviews. So, and it's a short book, so it's a good one to read. All right, Ephesians 1, 7, will you read that? In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, now let's read Ephesians 2. 8 through 10. So we are redeemed in Ephesians 1, 7 by the action of Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those of us who have a guilt, innocent worldview, it's all about us. It's what I can do. We Work-based salvation is one of the things that hinders, hinders us from being able to experience grace. But Ephesians 8, 2, 8 through 10 tells us that it's not about our works. In fact, we are a work of Jesus. Okay, Colossians 2, 13 to 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This passage is perfect for talking about the gospel with guilt and innocence. It talks about guilt. It talks about our debt. It talks about the action that God did on our behalf and how we're redeemed through grace. Okay, Acts 2, 38. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what do we need to do? What action is required on our part is to re repent. When we repent and we trust Christ as our savior, the first action that demonstrates our obedience is baptism. Okay, any time along the, the way, if you have a question or something and you want to tell us about that, you know, just go ahead and put it in the chats and we'll make sure that we address it. 
what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about shame versus honor. Now, shame versus honor is kind of the secondary worldview that most of us in the United States have, but it's the primary worldview of people who live in South Asia and in the Middle East. So um, societies that have a shame honor worldview, they um, value association with a group. So we are a society of individualists. We want to be pioneers, but they really value kind of being the same. Um, just last night, I was talking with my friend who is a missionary in the Philippines, and she was talking about the fact that uh, one of the people in their church who have trusted Christ as Savior and has been an integral part of the ministry there, um, her name is Lani, and Lani needed an income. Oh, yeah, we can do that. That's not a problem. Very happy to share. Um, so Lani needed an income, and they were looking for more opportunities to connect the gospel with people. And um, so what they were doing is Karen was noticing that there's 10 stores all in a row, and they sell all the exact same thing. 10 stores are all the same because they have that value of association. And so Karen's like, oh, let's we're going to make coffee time because all of these places here, they sell something different or the same. So we're going to be different. We're going to stand out. And Lonnie's like, I don't know if we want to do that. I'm not really sure about that. Well, they opened the store and, and things went really well for a long time. And um, people started opening the same store, like three on the same block. And oh. Karen was so frustrated that they copied her. And Lonnie's like, no, this is good. This is so good. Because that is the Filipino way. They're showing you honor by doing the same thing. Karen was so upset. They copied their logo. They copied the menu. They copied the descriptions. They copied the, the, the decor. And she's like, they're stealing from us. That's wrong. And Lonnie's like, no, they're showing you love. They're showing you honor because you, you did a good thing. And we want to be associated with that. So shame versus honor society, they care about association and they highly value relationships. Um, in the same story of, of Karen and um, uh, uh, the store, one of the main purposes of that was to provide Lonnie an income. And, and Karen and Patrick would say to Lonnie, is this what you want? Yes, yes, this is a good thing. Okay, so we're going to sign the paperwork for it. Now you want to work this. This is for you. You want to do this, right? Absolutely. It's a good thing that you're doing. It's a good thing that you're doing. After a year, she's, she quit. And Karen's like, why did you quit? We, we did this for you. She said, well, I didn't want to dishonor you by saying that your idea was bad. Uh -huh. So the relationship was more important than being honest. They raised children to be part of a community. So if, if we have children and we're in a shame honor society, we don't want our children to be set apart and to be different and, and to reach amazing goals. We want our children to be um, responsible and honoring to the community. We, we want to be a network. And when I do something um, that brings social credit to the community, and when I do something that's bad, then I dishonor and I shame the community. So honor and shame is a social credit within the society that affects me, it affects my spouse, it affects my family, it, respect, it affects my church. And you know, that's true here in the United States. If as a ministry leader, you know, let's say Michael is caught into sin, he's caught in sin and he's a ministry leader. Well, that brings shame on him brings shame on our family. It brings shame on the church and the ministry. It makes it harder for the church to be effective in their ministry. That's why we have child protection um, in our churches. That's why we have different rules and policies because we want to protect the name of Jesus and the testimony. Okay, so we're going to, um, oh, was there a question? Okay, no, okay. We're going to read through some scriptures, Romans 3.23. that one. <laughs> For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means the opposite of glory is shame. Okay. Glory is, is praise and honor and saying you are worthy. So if we've fallen short of that, we've brought shame and disgrace. Romans 10, 9 through 11. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, 
and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So, bring that back up for a second. Um, read 11. Oh, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So when we, be, if the opposite of not being put to shame is to bring honor, right? So one of the things that we found when we were in India is when we talked to people about um, reconnecting with God, they don't want to be reconnected with God because we're here on earth because we brought him shame. So we're going to go back to the scriptures in a minute, but I, I kind of want to bring this picture in for you. Um, I set down with a couple and um, their two-year-old or three-year-old son. We were in a temple uh, to Krishna and I was um, asking them saying, so I'm here because I want to learn about religion and I want to talk about religion and faith. And can you tell me a little bit about why you're here at this temple? Tell me about your religion and your faith. And I was told that uh, they are looking to find ways of escape. And that's what the process of yoga is. Yoga leads us to escape, to nirvana. So that way, not necessarily to reconnect with God, but to be um, escaping our shame, right? So the story is this. So there, there's so many, many, many gods, but they all have the same beginning story. And that's our God created us. We can agree with that, right? Our God created us. And when he created us, or she created us, everything was perfect and everything was beautiful and everything we needed was available. That's true in our story too. Our God created us. He made a perfect world for us and gave us all the things that we needed. But we wanted to do things our way. Mm, we also wanted to do things our way. And we were um, kicked out of the clouds. Well, we were kicked out of the garden, right? Because, because of our sin. In, in, in the Hindu story, we left the clouds or heaven, paradise. We left there to become kings and queens and rule over our own lives. But that's exactly what sin is. We want to rule over our own lives. But here's the difference. In our worldview of guilt, innocence, we say, I'm, I'm guilty and I need to find a way that somebody will call me innocent or I need to find a way that someone will pay my debt so that way um, I can be restored. But in the shame honor society, they don't want to remind their gods about who they are because they brought shame to them. So they don't want to go back to the clouds. So here we're saying in Romans 10, 9 through 11, or we're not saying it, God said it, that no one will be put to shame when we remind God of who we are. And guess what? We don't have to remind God. He's the one who pursued us. Amen. That we will not be put to shame that we will be actually placed in a, in a seat of honor. We, we become heirs with Jesus. Like how amazing is that? It also speaks to the confidence that we can have in God's word, that he is faithful to his promises. Yes. So that when we trust in him, that we will not be put to shame because our trust is not in ourselves, but it's in him who is faithful. And that's another contrast to the Hindu gods is so Another story, I was in a temple and um, I was talking to uh, one of the vendors. What happens is you go into the temple and then you buy things from the vendors and then you wait in a line forever and ever and ever. And then you take those things that you purchased and you lay them down as a sacrifice. Then a priest comes behind there and he takes them and he takes them back to the vendor to be sold again. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And they see nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but when when you're making, I said, why are we making the sacrifice? Why why are we selling these things to lay before the gods? And she said, well, we have to remind her that we're here. And I said, really? Is your God a powerful God? She must not be very powerful. And she said, oh, she's the most powerful. She's the most powerful. I said, well, then why do you have to remind her? She says, because I'm nothing. And I said, oh, that, I'm sorry to hear to hear that you think that you're nothing because really you're very valuable because my God has been pursuing you. I said, I have a question. Who loved who first? Did your God love you first or did you love your God first? She said, well, I love my God first. That's why I'm here because I'm trying to get my God to remember who I am so that way she'll give me some special favors or blessings. And I said, you know, I, I own a copy of God's word and in, in, the, in the book of his words, what it says is he first loved me. 
I said, think about that for a minute. The God I want to talk to you about loved you first and pursued you and demonstrated his love for you in sending Jesus. And then we talk about how Jesus laid aside his glory as God and came to earth as a man and then was publicly put to shame as he was stripped naked and beaten and hung on a cross for people to mock. He took our shame so we could be restored to a position of honor. So it's, it's in how that it's presented. Okay, um, Hebrews 12, 2. Sorry. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And that kind of goes with what I just said. All right. So Ephesians 1, 4 to 6. Remember I said Ephesians, you can just read straight through Ephesians to see all these worldviews presented. And as you're reading, you're going to be like, oh, I see that. That's shame, honor. That, that's fear, power. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, through six, to the, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. We didn't have to like curry favor with him. We didn't have to make sacrifices. Jesus sacrificed for us on our behalf. Okay, so then the third one is fear power. And so in South Asia, you're going to have as your primary honor, shame, and as your secondary fear power. And we were talking a little bit about um, Islam before. As a culture here in the United, as a society here in the United States, our cultures are a little blurred because we have multiple worldviews. And the same is true um, in India. And so the Hindu um, philosophy is going to be um, layered with the fear power philosophy from, from the Muslims. And the Muslims fear power philosophy is going to be layered with the honor shame. Okay, so these societies that have hold the worldview of fear versus power, they believe in unseen powers. We would say that they're superstitious. Um, they raise children to be aware of the supernatural and they seek to manipulate situations to their favor. Actually, in scripture, if you read about Simon, who, who wanted to have like the special abilities and so forth, um, that would be manipulating a situation into your favor. And so this is like where you have like witch doctors and, um, um, oh yeah, and spirits, they believe in spirits and they believe in demons and we should believe in demons and, and we should believe in the supernatural, um, but they don't have Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit to understand that um, we don't have to fight for our salvation and that God has kind of laid these things out for us. Okay, let's go ahead and we're going to look at Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is power, and the gospel brings out honor. Romans 1.16 is a really good verse to memorize. All right, back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians 1. All right, verses 19 through 21. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might? that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This is actually an amazing passage for all three worldviews. You know, it talks about power. It, it talks about um, the authority that God has over us and that he's given us authority too. You got to read 22 and 23. Okay. 
And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So yeah, it, it completes the power. And, and it goes along with, um, with Philippians chapter two as well. And um, what Christ did uh, here on earth elevates him in heaven where now he's seated at the right hand of Christ until, um, until he, God has put everything under his feet, right? And so it's, it's showing sense. that when he's putting everything under his feet, we don't have to fear uh, this, what they would call the spirits, the, the demons that, that fight against us because he's already conquered them. They, they have no power over us if we are under him as the church, as his body, uh, who he is the one who is filling all in all. And so because we have him as our God, not just as our distant God, but as a personal God who loved us, pursued us, and sought us out, and conquered sin and death, then we know that there is nothing that can separate us from his love. Uh, 2.18. Ephesians 2, verse 18 for through him, we both have access to one spirit to the Father, or in one spirit to the Father. So one of the things is when you're talking to someone who comes from a fear versus power worldview, you need to clarify who the Holy Spirit is, that the Holy Spirit is God, that he's part of the triune Godhead, and that it's not like I have... It's not like a, a good spirit versus bad spirit, like a good witch, bad witch of the Wizard of Oz kind of a deal, but th this is God himself. Okay, so we're not going to read all of John 3, but what I want to point out in John 3, um, I think in verse 8, can you scroll up a little bit? Uh, no, um, yeah, the, the wind blows. Start with... Uh, so Jesus, you know, told Nicodemus that we have to be born again, right? And he's like, how can we be born again? How can a man re-enter his, his mother's womb? And then in verse 5, Jesus answered. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When you're talking with someone who has a fear versus power worldview, they understand the supernatural exists, and they understand spiritual things so much better than we do who are very science-minded. You know, the word science, it, it makes me laugh because science simply means the study of. Um, so it means like we don't really know, so we're learning, we're going to watch and we're going to observe and we're going to see if it repeats and, and we're going to find out what things we can know. Um, but science sometimes sounds like this is the end of it. We're, we're learning, we're learning, we're learning. So my whole point about the fear power is that uh, when you're talking to someone about God through fear of who have a fear power worldview, they're going to be more receptive to understanding um, spiritual things. Okay, 14.6. Uh, On 14.6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Someone in a fear power worldview is looking for the way. What is the way that I can be redeemed? What is the way that I can be made safe, that I can be saved? Well, that way is Jesus. So Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So someone with a fear power worldview, they're going to... Um, Faith is easier for them, that, that they, they already um, know that they can't see everything, but they, they can place their faith in that, their trust in that. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about contextualization. So, um, again, just kind of touching based on the three that we just passed. Uh, obviously, the select verses that we chose are not 
exhaustive. <laughs> there are so many more that we could put in. Some of them, as you read them, you can even see more than one culture that's in there. Um, but just to be aware that sometimes using a particular verse for a uh, for sharing the gospel may be more effective to one who's under a different culture in, in that sense. And so knowing that um, you're coming, coming from the uh, guilt innocence, talking to someone in the shame honor, uh, using a different verse maybe may touch their heart more than the verses that touched yours to lead you to Christ. So this kind of pour, pours into uh, contextualization and there are books written on this and uh, we're not gonna cover all of it. So this is, as we stated at the beginning, this is all intro. So what is contextualization? Well, well before I forget, Paul Hybert, um, I'm sorry, Hebert, H. Uh, E-I-B-E-R-T, -E Paul, Paul Hebert. He um, has written like nine books, but they're kind of all the same. So whichever one that you get, you're going to be good with. So like if someone has one, they can give it to you. You'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> but uh, cultural anthropology or um, missional anthropology. Um, what was the, the one that you read recently? Um, Paradigm. Paradigms and Conflict, that one. Yeah, Paradigms and Conflict. That, that's actually a really good one. Paradigms and Conflict, probably the one that I would recommend to read. But contextualization, like if you read Paradigms and Conflict by Paul Hebert, um, would really help you with understanding how to present the gospel and how to answer questions that people have through a biblical lens, like difficult questions. And it's very, very practical and easy to read. Um, but he is a missionary for 20 years in Japan. And that's back when they just said, here's your plane ticket. We're so glad you're gonna be a missionary and don't give any training whatsoever on sharing the gospel or on connecting with people who have a different worldview from you. And, and so he did a great job of kind of outlining that for all of us so we can, we can benefit from that. All right, so what is contextualization? Well, it's putting new information into context in a way that is highly valued by a society. So it's putting it into a way that society values so that they can uh, better understand the message that you're sharing. But we do want to be careful to avoid changing the message itself to fit the agenda or to fit the context, but instead look for openings to share the unchanging message. So in Acts 17.22, in the following verses, we read that Paul addressed the people. He paid them high honor by recognizing their religious devotion, and he took the opportunity of using the temple to the unknown God as the bridge to share the gospel. So you might remember that where uh, Paul went into the Areopolis and was able to talk to them about, um, oh, you've got this temple out here to the unknown God. Well, let me tell you a little bit about who this God is and uh, shared with, use that as an inroad to share the gospel. Um, so just as a uh, little bit of information, the Hindu religion is uh, derived from the Greek religion. Uh, therefore, following Paul's lead here is very appropriate. Um, one, one more mention on this is that it is essential that we do not change that message in order right. to fit the context. Um, because the some, method of our delivery is needs to change according to time and to place, society and culture, but the message does not change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. And God's word has remained constant and inerrant and applicable and relevant. So we've clarified the gospel. We've refined our testimonies, um, we've defined societies and culture, and we took a, a very brief overlook of the three major worldviews. Um, so how do we use all of this to reach our community with the gospel? Um, we're going to very briefly touch on this. We only have you know a few more minutes. We actually do an entire workshop called Know Your Neighbor to kind of figure out how to build these bridges, but I just want to give you kind of something to think about and to get started in your own mind. Um, 
first, we want to honor anyone with whom we're speaking. I mean, it's a very biblical concept, right? First uh, Peter 2, 17 tells us to honor everyone, to love the family of believers, to fear God, and to you know, respect our government leaders. Um, how can we honor someone from a Hindu background when kind of saying, you are believing a lie <laughs> and I want to tell you the truth? Well, <laughs> We really want to respect them. And one of the ways that we can bring honor to someone who values honor um, is to let them speak first. So what you want to do is you want to give them the opportunity to share first while you are listening. When you sit and you listen, you're sharing honor. So it starts with asking questions. Yeah. Well, let me say another thing. Sit down. Like, seriously. Um, if you are elevated over someone then you're showing dominance and that's not honoring that's a place of honor that you're given um, so if you're going to speak with someone always sit down and um, it's okay to slouch a little bit because if i'm slouching to be a little smaller than michael oh, right here if i kind of do that <laughs> then i'm showing him honor by not trying to be taller than him um, so that sounds kind of silly but this is part of their worldview and their culture, what they honor and, and value. And so slouching, you don't have to have perfect posture. You can slouch and you'll be being respectful that way. They'll, they'll be more likely to hear you. Being relaxed. Yeah, Show, doing things like don't cross your arms, don't cross your legs. Um, if you're invited to somebody's home, make sure you take your shoes off before you go inside. Mm -hmm. If you want to, um, really have a conversation with them, invite them for coffee or tea and take a long time to sip on that hot drink because we spend money and we, we're stewards of time and we want to value your time by only taking a small bit of it. But the Hindu society is not that way. In fact, you're going to demonstrate honor for them by taking a long time. We, we were walking down the street and Michael asked somebody if he could talk to them a little bit about their faith and their religion. And they just sat down on the sidewalk and they sat there for like four hours having a conversation. You had a conversation with someone on the steps um, to, the, to the mosque. And we had a conversation with a, a man from the Hindu faith on the steps of a Muslim mosque in mm -hmm. India. Yes, and for hours, for hours they sat there talking, and they, and it's a whole other story that yes. um, Kevin has heard, but we'll have to share it another yes. time. We gotta, we gotta watch our time. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, let me repeat: you want to give them the opportunity to speak first. So tell them that you would like to know more about their faith and their beliefs. Hey, can you tell me more about your faith and your beliefs? I would really like to know. I'd like to know more about who you are and, and your culture. Um, and then listen, like really listen. Don't interrupt, allow spaces of time. We sat in a, um, in a marketplace outside the mosque for a couple of hours sipping tea. And I think we had a conversation that would have taken like 10 minutes here in, in the United States, but it took a couple hours. Um, and we did get to the gospel, but quiet and silence is okay. And, and, and to have big chunks of it. They're not tuning you out. They're really thinking and processing about what you said. And you honor them by giving them the chance to kind of like percolate that. In their so after they've shared with you, um, and make sure not to talk over them or anything, you know, but ask their permission to share your faith. You know, thank you for sharing your beliefs with me. I really appreciate learning about your culture. Do you mind if I share my faith with you? Um, and then because they want to honor you, they're going to say yes. They won't say no, I promise. You won't have anyone tell you no. It'll be a very rare occurrence. They'll say, okay, sure. And But this is probably what they'll say. Okay, okay. But I believe all religions are good and all religions are the same. And we each find our own way to God. This is their way of telling you that they don't want a conflict. They don't want a debate. They don't want an argument that um, Indians are, are very prideful of peace, that they have never gone to war with another nation. Now they've been occupied many times. So they would say that they've never been at war, that different countries have come in and occupied them. And that's part of their culture that they, that, uh, the violence. And we'll talk about violence another time. Um, but 
just know this is not a time for apologetics. This is, and there is a time for apologetics, but this is not it. This is the time for you to share your story, your testimony. And in your testimony, you want to make sure that it's rich with scripture because it's God's word. And if God's word promises that it won't come back void, then what else will we want to use, right? We want to provide a clear gospel message. We want to keep it very simple. Um, and we, we want to make sure that we have a call to action. At the end, say, do you believe this? Do you want to call Jesus as Lord? You know, would you agree that this is true? You have to give them an opportunity to respond because if you don't give them an opportunity to respond, then they say, you believe what you believe and I'll believe what I believe and together we can be happy. Together we will find the middle. That, that's kind of an idiom for them. Um, not you, not me, but somewhere in, the middle, somewhere, in, the somewhere in between, yeah. right? So that's kind of where that they will come with you. You don't want to go there. You want to say, my God loves you. My God is the one and only God, and he pursued you. Would you call him Lord? And, and put your hands out like this, like you're giving a gift because you are, and allow them to receive it. <laughs> so what we want to do is just kind of open up this time for questions. So here's the thing, you might have questions tomorrow or next week or a month from now. Totally feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, you can get our contact information at multiplyministries.org. Here, I'll put it in here. My Facebook. Is ministry mom, right? Yeah. Huh? That's what I don't know. I yeah. don't type that in. So um, <laughs> you can reach out to us at director at multiplyministries.org. Don't think, oh, my question's really small. I don't want to ask it. I don't want to take their time because that's not true. Like, this is totally what we're here for. So I'll pull up Bill's question. Sorry. Um, I'll pull up Bill's question from the chat, um, just in case you guys missed it. Um, he said, does the idea of earning your way to heaven or just being a good person get you into heaven fall into any particular worldview? Uh, would you guys want to expand on that a little bit at all? So that's part of the guilt, innocence worldview. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm a good person, then I'm innocent. And if I'm innocent, I should go to heaven because only guilty people go to hell. Or uh, what was the other way that was described? Um, uh, it was either oh, earning your way to heaven. Yeah, yeah earning so your way to heaven like or good, good works. You no, know, paying paying my debt. Um, if if I'm doing good things, I'm earning my way. That that means I I'm just in being able to go to heaven. But there, didn't we see some of that in the Hindu temple about doing more good than bad? Yeah. Um, so. For a Hindu, they want to try to escape, right? They, they, they feel like their body is evil. That's another thing is, is they believe it's like- Gnostic. Yeah, it's, it's very Gnostic, absolutely. And um, Hinduism kind of came about the time of Gnosticism. It, it, it's all, the Aryans went from Greece to India and the Hindus began, Hinduism began. Mm -hmm. But so they believe that their body is actually kind of a punishment from the gods, that they're limited to their body instead of being spiritual. And so when they do, when they do the chant, chanting, the word is om. And when you say om, you're emptying yourself of your body so you can receive a spirit to come into you. And then maybe if you have a spirit that come into you, the God will see you and see you as a God and then um, allow you to return to the clouds without any, without any honor. And so that's what yoga is all about, is taking on the form of an animal or something that doesn't have guilt. And it's funny because they said that they're not guilt innocence, but there's still that aspect. Well, yeah, one of the things that we had talked about um, when we first talked, Michelle, was 
they, these are not mutually exclusive categories. Right. Um, everybody has some formula of uh, mm. along the spectrum yes. of guilt, innocence, shame, honor, and fear, power. Um, and so I would almost right. even put it in a, in a triangle and maybe yes. that would be a fun activity for you guys in your next session. Uh, I'll take royalties on that later. Um, <laughs> awesome. Where would you place yourself in that triangle? Um, because we so all actually have the that. 3D... Go ahead. The 3D gospel, the book, the 3D gospel, they actually have the triangle in there with the circles and um, kind of showing, you know, where you fit and where the overlap is kind of like a Venn diagram times three. So Amanda and Glenn asked a question in the chat. Um, is sin something that we need to explain? Is it meaningful to the Hindu? Yes, you definitely have to define sin. So we would normally define sin here. Like if I were working, I have a high school small group I work with on Sundays. And if they bring in a new friend and I always share the gospel the, the first time somebody comes because they might not come again and say sin is anything that we think, say, or do um, in disobedience to God. But to someone who comes from a shame honor society, I say it differently. I say Sin is anything we think, say, or do that brings honor, dishonor or shame to God. It's the same. When we disobey God, we dishonor him. And when we dishonor God, we're disobeying. It's both sin. But how you phrase it makes a difference. Yeah. The, and the 3D gospel book, it's really short. It, it's, it's like a glorified pamphlet. <laughs> So you can read it very quickly. Oh, another book that is good is um, Across the Street and Around the World um, by, by Jeannie Marie. And that's not her full name because she's a missionary and she works in a restricted area. Um, and so that's why it, it doesn't sound like a last name. Um, but the first half of that book is really written to every Christian everywhere and, and how you can connect uh, with people in your everyday circle to bring the gospel. And then the second half is really kind of taking these worldviews and um, connecting, um, connecting them to the gospel through scripture, through those worldviews. Uh, the first half really starts with her story. And I feel like if you read that, you'd be like, this is exactly where I am right now. Because the beginning, she was like feeling convicted that she was called to missions, that maybe she should be kind of missional in her everyday life right now. And so she and her two-year-old uh, go down to this refugee um, center that's run by Muslims for Muslims. And she says to them that she, yeah, that's it there. She, she says to them that she wants to serve them. And they're looking at her like, really? And she's like, well, so here's the reason why, because I believe in Jesus and I follow him and he says I'm supposed to love my enemies. And then she's like, oops, <laughs> she's like, and I'm supposed to love on foreigners in this land. And like, she's like, I'm digging myself deeper, deeper, deeper. She's like, I'm just supposed to love my neighbor and you're my, my, my late, my neighbor. How can I do that? And then, so um, I, I'm not going to tell you her story because it's really worth reading in the order that in the way that she, she tells it. But I think that you'll find yourself in it very quickly and be able to find some very practical ways for reaching your neighbor with the gospel through an authentic relationship. So regarding uh, Chinese, Japanese, and their worldview, they will be similar in the shame honor culture. Um, yet you, each of them individually will will follow probably something different as there, there's Buddhism as well as other forms of mysticism that they would follow, which you will not be able to determine without speaking to them individually. And yes. I think one of the key things for us all to remember is that don't look at it so much as I'm going to go to this person here um, and share the gospel and they're going to trust Christ right away. Will that happen? Yes. Praise the Lord. It will. But what it's going to take is building relationships with the individuals on a, and get to know them in a personal manner. So that you're sharing your testimony might just be an introduction. 
And uh, you need to work to build a relationship with individuals in order for them to begin to trust you, to listen to you, to hear what you have to say. And uh, that's how you'll begin to understand what their individual worldview is by talking to them. Your testimony, we cannot overemphasize how important your testimony is. And let me explain another reason why. In Hinduism, they do not believe in dogma. In fact, they feel that their religion is superior to Christianity because we have a set doctrine. They, they think it's laughable that we can go into your church of a different denomination in a, in a different state and be able to worship with you, worship the same way, the same God, and have the same beliefs of, of the same teaching. Because to them, each person has their own doctrine or their own dogma, and everyone finds their own way to God. You'll hear that phrase over and over again. Your religion is good. My religion is good. We all find our own way. When you find your way, that's good. They don't understand how we all have the same way. But yeah, so universalism. Um, if you've heard of the Baha'i, if you've heard of Mormonism, those are just Western reflections of Hinduism. They, their origins are in Hinduism. So is Buddhism, Jainism. But um, all of those developed um, from the same roots. Yes. One. Sorry, our son is asking for dessert. <laughs> I was just going to ask that question. Of You've got five kids at home. How are you both able to be on this call and have them? <laughs> we have a 15 and a 17-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son who is overseeing eating pizza and watching a movie in the bedrooms. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. No, no, no. I mean, that's why we're here. <laughs> we could also ask Kevin later <laughs> if you feel more comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, you sure I'll, have it. I'll just email and ask Michelle and Michael. <laughs> there you go. All right, well, like well, go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, no, I, I said that's that sounds like a plan. You know, I'm okay. sure we'll have lots of questions later on after we're offline, but we can get in touch with you and ask you questions, right? Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and Bill, I think you uh, unmuted. To, did you have something to say also? That was quite astute of you to see that i not really that i have something to say i just really want to thank you guys it, it was great and yes. i think some of the some of the stuff you were saying about the application is really applicable to my friends my friends yeah. my co-workers they say the same thing yeah we'll all mm -hmm. get find our own way to it. Right? right right so it was so, great thanks something i actually learned from my nine-year-old in sharing the gospel is um, he was talking to his friend and he said, uh, oh, she came to the door to see if, if he could play. And he, he said, no, we're, we're getting ready for Easter. We were actually doing a Seder dinner. He says, we're preparing for Easter. And she's like, well, what is Easter? And he says, well, Easter is when, what, how did you say it? The, um, when the king of the world came down and died for us. And she said, who is that? And he said, that's Jesus. She says, I don't know Jesus. And he says, that's okay. That's kind of the point. None of us know Jesus. We all want to find our own way. And so therefore we don't recognize him when we see him. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's how, you know, I want to start sharing the gospel from now on is that we, we all want to do things our own way. And so therefore we don't recognize him when we see him. Mm -hmm. hmm. So good. Right, well, let's, we're going to pray over you, and then if you guys have more questions, you know, you can reach out to Kevin, you can reach out directly to us. Um, our information is in the comments. Yeah. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all of these people, these, these children of you who love you and who are devoted to helping others to know you who are taking your great commission seriously to, to reach 
um, others with the gospel and, and to make them disciples by living together with them in an authentic relationship. Lord, I just pray a hedge of protection over the families that are here because we know, Father God, that as they serve you, the enemy will cower in fear and have a tantrum. So Lord, I just pray for protection in that way. Lord, I pray that they would be fully aware of the Holy Spirit who lives within them, who empowers them to do the work that you've called them to do. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit's voice would be well known to those who are about to hear about Jesus for the first time, that they would be receptive to your word and that there would just be um, growth both spiritually and numerically um, for your house, for your church in New Jersey, Father God. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. Have thank you, evening. everyone, for coming out. Michelle, Michael, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate so your time.